The World Health Organization warns further cases of Ebola in Europe are now unavoidable. The European Commission demands to know how a nurse working in a Madrid hospital became infected as two more people are quarantined. Also tonight, ex-Guantanamo inmate Merwin Begg says he offered to help find Alan Henning but was ignored by the government. Turkey calls for international support as IS fighters advance on its Syrian border. And the pride of Britain in a young girl who fought off an attacker to protect her mum and baby sister. This is ITV News at 6.30 with Mary Nightingale and Alistair Stewart. Good evening. With a nurse in Madrid fighting Ebola and two further people in quarantine, the World Health Organization has warned cases will spread through Europe. It says the continent is well placed to deal with an outbreak, but the nurse, who was the first to contract the disease outside Africa, will not be the last. And today the European Commission asked Spain to explain how the nurse became affected with Ebola despite strict procedures at the Madrid hospital where she worked. An investigation is now underway. From Madrid, Neil Connery with the latest. This is the hospital room in Madrid where a patient with Ebola was being treated. But one of the nurses somehow became infected here. And now that nurse, Teresa Romero, is being held in isolation in the very same hospital. Her husband is also in quarantine, and one other person is undergoing tests. Outside, some of the hospital's own staff have been demonstrating today, calling for more information about what went wrong. It has been really surprising that this happened here with all of the security measures. They have not provided any convincing information for us. I think they should provide more about what happened and what was the failure. Hospital staff have told the newspaper, Al Pais, that their protective suits were not up to the standards set by the World Health Organization. They wore latex gloves sealed with duct tape and simple surgical masks, when staff say they should have worn full breathing apparatus. And they say waste from infected patients was carried in the same lift used by all staff. The hospital insists it complied with all necessary protocols. The director of public health in Spain said the nurse who contracted the virus entered the room of an Ebola victim twice, once while he was alive and a second time to collect materials after he died. Teresa Romero is 40 years old and was transported between hospitals last night, although she's not thought to have left Madrid recently. Officials are so far monitoring more than 20 people who came into contact with her. The World Health Organization have said while governments are well prepared, the spread of Ebola in Europe is, in their words, quite unavoidable. Well, there is fear and anger tonight here in Madrid at how all of this could have happened. The nurse in question, Teresa Romero, being treated in the special isolation unit of the very hospital where she worked trying to save the lives of those missionaries. We understand that she is in a stable condition. Three of the other people uh, who've been quarantined, we understand tests have come back on one of those in the last hour and they thankfully have proved negative. But the authorities here are under huge pressure for action and answers. The European Commission has asked for a full and urgent report. The Spanish government says it believes it's done everything that it can to contain this. The honest answer tonight though is that no one here really knows. Neil Connery in Madrid, thank you. Well, here, health officials have reiterated their belief that the UK is prepared to respond to Ebola. Public Health England said there is a low but real risk of someone arriving from West Africa with the virus. Well, our political correspondent Emily Morgan is live outside the Department of Health with the very latest. Emily. Well, news that the Ebola virus has been contracted in Europe has inevitably sparked fears that it has the potential to spread here. And that's a very important word, potential. It does, of course, have the potential to be imported here. There are no travel bans in place and it does, of course, only take under 10 hours to fly from West Africa to London. But Public Health England say that the UK is very prepared. It's a very low risk and the NHS has a well-tested and robust system in place to deal with it.
There is uh, a low risk of somebody coming to the UK with the disease. There is very, very little risk of us having anything like an outbreak of Ebola virus disease because of all the systems that we have in place. Uh, I'm confident that we've got the systems in place to identify and test and treat appropriately. Well, if evidence was needed that the government is taking this seriously, I understand that the Prime Minister is considering chairing a meeting of COBRA where they will discuss the Ebola outbreak and the risks that it poses, and that could happen tomorrow. It is important to remember that a British nurse has already been treated for Ebola here in this country. Uh, sources here at the Department of Health say that he is now free of it and his recovery is testament to the NHS's ability to contain it and treat a patient. Emily, thank you. The former Guantanamo Bay prisoner, Mirzan Beg, claims he offered to help find the murdered British hostage, Alan Henning, but was ignored by officials. He says he had contacts with Islamic State, but the government here didn't want to know. But today, David Cameron said he should now tell all. Paul Davis reports. Earlier this month, Mozem Beg was released from Belmarsh Prison after terror charges against him were dropped. Today, he was the one doing the accusing, saying the government didn't allow him to help the hostage, Alan Henning. He says he offered to make an appeal for mercy to the aid workers' captors, an offer that was ignored. The government's response was, thank you, but we don't need your help. Um, after that, shortly, I was arrested. It is impossible to know whether those holding Alan Henning could have been persuaded to show mercy. But Begg believes as a former Guantanamo Bay detainee, he had the right credentials. I know what it's like to be dressed in an orange suit and threatened with execution, as the Americans had done with me. Um, in addition to this, I have made uh, representations before and calls for release of hostages. He says he's been successful in helping secure the release of two prisoners and should have been allowed to try. To, to simply dismiss it and to not look at it uh, properly and give it its worth um, was at best negligent on part of the government. This is the letter Beg wrote to the leader of Islamic State, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, and gave to the Foreign Office. It wasn't sent. Officials here at the Foreign Office won't comment on Mosan Beg's claim that an offer that might have helped Alan Henning was rejected, quoting their policy of not publicly discussing cases of kidnap. The former Foreign Office Minister, Alistair Burt, has confirmed on Twitter that he met Mosan Beg. Alan Henning's family today preferred not to enter any debate about lost opportunities. The Prime Minister has said if Mosem Beg has any information about the Islamic State hostage takers, he should share it. Paul Davis, ITV News. America launched a series of airstrikes on the Syrian town of Kobani today in an effort to prevent it falling into Islamic State hands. Kurdish forces defending the town have been losing the ground battle with the militants. Now, Turkey, whose border is just metres away, is calling for more international help. Our diplomatic correspondent John Ray reports. If there is to be salvation for the besieged people of Kobani, it will come from the skies, courtesy of the United States Air Force. Each blast is applauded by Turks who have gathered to watch just across the border. This aerial assault has come late in the day. Just as Islamic State fighters are reaching the town, they are heavily armed, equipped with tanks and momentum. This fighter boasts of soon finishing the battle. With God's help, we will liberate Kobani, he says. A victory that, if sealed, would signal a significant and humiliating defeat for the West and its allies. Because Kobani lies right on the border with Turkey, at its closest less than 100 metres away. The militants are pushing in from the east, taking the high ground at Mistano and parts of the town itself. And today, they moved in from the southwest as well, leaving the Kurds clinging on to the town centre. The airstrikes launched by the US over the past 24 hours mark a desperate effort to hold back their advance. The town's Kurdish defenders are running out of ammunition and perhaps time. 
Over the border, at a camp for the war's refugees, the Turkish president predicted Kobani's imminent fall. But he hasn't ordered his army to intervene. At the border, they wait, imposing, but so far impotent. John Ray, ITV News. Here, four men were arrested in London today, suspected of being Islamist terrorists, and one of them is believed to be an IS supporter recently back from Syria. Richard Pallow is outside Scotland Yard. Richard, what are you hearing about this? Well, we understand that the raids took place at dawn this morning at several addresses across West London. The four men arrested are the ages of 20 or 21, and we understand, importantly, that they have links with the Islamic State and that one of them, one of them, has returned uh, from Syria. Also, all of them are reportedly residents here in the UK. Now, the fact that specialist firearm officers were on the scene suspects or suggests that the authorities knew the risk was high. No shots were fired, but a taser was. One of the suspects who was struck was left unharmed and are not requiring further medical treatment. As for the suspected plot, well, crucially, that was in the early stages of attack planning, but there was no settled target or method as yet, they understand. All four men are still being questioned at police stations in London this evening. Richard Pallow at Scotland Yard, thank you. Nick Clegg has promised the Liberal Democrats will raise the personal tax-free allowance much sooner than the Tories if the party stays in government. He hopes that will win over the public ahead of next year's general election. Uh, today on the issue of airport expansion, he couldn't even win over his own party at their conference in Glasgow. After his Mr Clegg spoke to our political editor, Tom Bradby. Nick Clegg is a leader who could do with fewer political problems in his life, so imagine his delight today as his party opted to stick with a policy on airport expansion he profoundly disagrees with. My personal view is that the position that was debated and uh, agreed upon today, I don't think it makes sense. Uh, I've got to be open with you. I just really don't think it makes sense to say you're never going to have a single metre of extra concrete anywhere in any runway anywhere in the United Kingdom. Part of his irritation was due to the way this overshadowed his new economic policy, more capital gains on the rich in return for an increase in the personal allowance. But what about those deficit reduction plans? Uh, but what about the £37.6 billion pounds that the IFS says is the hole you've got to fill, according to your commitments? You haven't even started on that in the next parliament. No, I don't think any of the parties yet have, uh, have crossed all the T's and dotted the I's. Clearly not, uh, you know, eight months before a general election. I think what, I think what you're getting now is a picture of where the choices will lie. I, I was bewildered, and I still am, by the decision that the Conservative leadership have done, David Cameron and George Osborne, to say to the British people that they, the Conservatives, are going to handpick the working age poor as being the only section in society that will pick up the tab, will make additional sacrifices because of the debts that have been racked up in the past. You talk about making choices, but you're not making any choices at all, really. You come up with a new policy, which is costed, so you're going to take some more tax in, but you're immediately giving it out again. Meanwhile, the IFS says you've got a nearly £40 billion black hole to fill, and you've made almost no contribution to filling that at all, except to say what you don't like. No, that's not true. There are other taxes where we say we should go to deficit reduction. So, for instance, um, we have said that uh, well, your so-called mansion tax, but that is a relatively small amount of money compared to the well, size of the whole. You might call one and a half billion pounds uh, small. It is not out small. of forty. I think well, it is. Look, look, just look at what we've done. Uh, it is because of Danny Alexander and myself in government, and particularly a Liberal Democrat and the Treasury, that we found a hundred and twenty-six billion pounds worth of savings over the last four years. We're borrowing money at very low rates at the moment, and one might argue that trying to eliminate the deficit totally is somewhat fetishistic. No, instead of no, 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 no. I'll explain to you why. Next year, we will spend as a country. 59 billion, I find that an almost unimaginably large amount of money, 59 billion pounds. Good way to imagine it is about half the size of the whole of the NHS budget. And that money is going only on paying the interests of the accumulated mountain of debt, which is still accumulating. Right? His mantra, sensible economics with a social conscience. Tom Bradby, ITV News in Glasgow. Still to come, former England cricket star Kevin Peterson on bullying, infighting and the man he blames for losing the Ashes. Please welcome the incredibly brave Renee May Bolton. A remarkable story of courage and a young girl who's now among the pride of Britain. But first, the first woman to give birth after undergoing a womb transplant has spoken of her joy and being able to have a baby. She was born without a uterus, but had the transplant operation in Sweden last year. Martha Fairley reports. 
He is just a few weeks old, but the arrival of baby Vincent brings hope to thousands of women. He's the first child to be born after a womb transplant, although he's yet to understand his place in medical history. His parents don't want to be named, but speaking for the first time since his birth, they say they're just like any new family. Oh, yeah, made history. It's hard to, um, to answer, but um, for us it feels like we are uh, normal parents with a newborn baby. Vincent's mother was born without a uterus and when she was 15 was told she would never bear children. She was one of nine women to undergo pioneering womb transplant surgery in Sweden last year. Now age 36, she can't quite believe she's become a mother. Oh, yeah, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic feeling. I really felt like a mother at the first time. So even if I've had years and years of sorrow and loss of hope, um, at the first touch and when I saw my baby, uh, I just felt as a mother. Vincent was born prematurely, but in good health. His father says despite the risks involved, they never gave up hope. The wish that you had for to have a child together was uh, enormous, but we didn't doubt. There wasn't, uh, wasn't any space for doubt in this, in this project. And they hope their baby boy will inspire other couples struggling with infertility. Martha Fairley, ITV News. The former flatmate and chauffeur of Jimmy Savile allegedly brought a 15-year-old girl to Savile's flat so that they could both rape her, a jury heard today. The prosecution said Ray Terrett met the girl in a club in Manchester in the early 1960s before taking her to meet Savile. He denies 18 counts of rape. The former Smiths frontman Morrissey has today revealed he has been treated for cancer after cancelling a string of gigs in June. He told a Spanish newspaper he has had cancerous tissue removed from his body four times this year. And the Formula One driver Jules Bianchi is critical but stable according to a statement released by his team today. He's currently being treated in hospital in Japan after a crash during Sunday's Japanese Grand Prix. He remains in intensive care with serious head injuries. Now, eight months after he was sacked by England, Kevin Peterson is the talk of cricket again. He's spoken for the first time about bitter infighting in the England team, exposed in the weeks before his dismissal. Our sports correspondent Ian Payne has been speaking to him. He is one of England's greatest ever batsmen, part of the most successful England team in history. But behind the celebration, there was isolation. Kevin Peterson was eventually sacked, labelled disruptive and unpopular. But now, for the first time, he's told his side of the story. He says players were bullied and some couldn't cope. He got to breaking point. The guys were at him every single day. They were having him at the field. Move, do this, do that. Why are you not doing this? Why are you not doing that? And then he would shift off his mark a little bit and they would go at him. And then eventually, he just snapped. That was a reference to batsman Jonathan Trott, who last year had to return home from Australia, suffering from stress. Peterson says wicketkeeper Matt Pryor led the bullying. He called himself the Big Cheese, he says. Pryor joked of the book in reaction, might bully my kids into getting it for me for Christmas. The ECB, which runs the England team, told ITV News today the ECB has not received complaints of bullying from any other England players and there is no evidence to support these claims. Peterson also told us today that coach Andy Flower was to blame for their thrashing down under. It's not about the way the cricket was. It's not, it wasn't one to you know, nick it off to slip. It's the environment. It's the way the boys were in the team. It was horrendous. And you never judge a person on when they went in or when they're great, you judge them on when they're rock bottom. That's how I judge people. One former England captain told me today some players were jealous of Peterson's lucrative endorsements and huge salary for playing in the IPL in India. But does Peterson think he'll ever play for England again? I don't know. I hope so. I live in hope, but I don't know. If this is the end for him, let's hope he'll be remembered for his record-breaking run scoring rather than a book. Ian Payne, ITV News. And finally tonight, the remarkable story of 10-year-old Renee Mae Bolter, whose astonishing bravery saved the life of her mother and baby sister. Yeah, she protected them from a violent attacker who held them hostage for eight hours. Today, Renee Mae met the Prime Minister after being honoured at last night's Pride of Britain Awards. Rupert Evelyn went to meet her. 
She was just seven years old and terrified. But in the midst of extreme violence aimed at her mother and baby sister, Renee May Bolter found extraordinary courage. You got that award for something you did when you were seven years old. Can you just tell me what you did? Um, I protected my sister so we didn't, so she didn't get hurt, and I, um, I hid the phone so we could get out. And how did you know? I, I read your story. I, how did you know to do that? I don't know. I don't know. I just loved them, and so I did it. You just love them. <laughs> Inside her Walsall home, an obsessive, jealous man armed with petrol was attacking Rene May's mother and baby sister, but the little girl stood in his way. She was punched, bruised, bleeding, but still had the presence of mind to plan an escape from the devastation. What made you think, I must get Mummy's phone? Because he was asking for it and I thought if we did that we might have had a chance. Without Rene doing what she did we would have all been dead. We wouldn't be here today. Small wonder that in a room filled with stars, one little girl outshone them all. Renee, we think you are probably the bravest person in the world. <laughs> Presented with a Child of Courage Award, Renee May, who is now 10, has earned the respect of an entire nation. Simon, can I give you any interesting tips? He said that I'm a little pop star. A pop star in the eyes of an X Factor judge, but in the eyes of her country, she is the pride of Britain. Rupert Evelyn, ITV News. And you can watch Rene May and many others receive their honours at the Pride of Britain Awards here on ITV at 8 o'clock this evening. But that is it for now. There is, of course, lots more on our website, itv.com slash news, including the six-month off from Glasgow with a really uncanny sense of balance. <laughs> Uh, Alistair and Charlene, well, I can't believe that. We'll be back with the ITV News at 10, but for now, for both of us, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>